Okay, so welcome everybody to the Institute for Sport and Physical Activity uh, Research Seminar Series. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome uh, our speaker today, Francis Quinn. Um, just to let you all know before I introduce Francis properly, um, that we are recording this session um, and we'll make that available. Um, if you have any questions or anything you want to ask Francis, if you can put them in the chat function um, and then Jeff and I will pick them up and pose them to Francis at the end of the session. So um, absolutely delighted Francis has agreed to speak for us today. Francis is a psychologist based um, in Aberdeen's, um, in the University of Aberdeen School of Psychology. Uh, well, no, you're not. Sorry, Francis, you're now at the Recording more. University. Not what am I on about? <laughs> So he trained um, at the University of Aberdeen um, and we were just having a lovely conversation there that he trained uh, with a major in psychology but um, also with French and a bit of Russian I think you were saying there Francis. Yeah, um, first and second <laughs> but I've forgotten and, it all now. <laughs> I'm sure it'd come back to you if you needed it. So Francis works in the area of health psychology, he um, has a special interest in exercise psychology including motivation and experience of exercise and the applications of psychology to the fitness industry. Um, he has done a, a phenomenal amount of work in the area and one uh, major project that I've been lucky enough to work with Francis on is an oral history of health psychology. So over the last, um, gosh, maybe five, six years, Francis, we've been um, we've been involved in this project that was published this year, which was an absolute delight um, to work on. But Francis is going to talk to us today about exercises, perceptions of the benefits of exercising in public places. And Francis, I'm going to hand over to you. OK, thank you so much, Angel, for that lovely introduction. So um, thanks, everybody, for inviting me here. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm Francis. I'm a psychologist interested in a lot of things around physical health, but particularly exercise, physical activity. Um, what I'm going to share with you today are some findings from a piece of qualitative research I've been doing um, in collaboration with a couple of other psychologists. Um, one is a sport and exercise psychologist at Glasgow Caledonian called Brian McCann, and the other is another, another health psychologist who mainly does research on physical activity with qualitative methods, and that's Gemma Stevens, and she's in the same department as me um, at RGU, as we tend to call it, and, uh, and Robert Gordon, uh, it isn't a random name, he was a, a merchant and a philanthropist in, in the 18th century. And I kind of think of RGU actually as being pretty similar to Bedfordshire University. Um, you know, we have sports science, sport and exercise science. Um, it's a post-92 university. Um, so I think there's some parallels there. And I have been to Bedfordshire University. I have been to the Bedford campus um, because I did a research related visit uh, to Angel there once. And it was very nice. I enjoyed being at the Bedford campus. Um, hope to be there again at some point after after COVID. So I just want to acknowledge some funding um, from the uh, university's foundation, which is the RGU Foundation, um, who really came to the rescue uh, when we started this study unfunded, which turned out to be a huge mistake because we were then just didn't have time to transcribe these interviews. So they really helped us by stepping in and we were able to get the interviews transcribed. And I've got my contact details on this slide. So please feel free just to email me at any time or you can follow me on, on Twitter um, as, as well. OK, on we go, everybody. Um, so. Can I go to the next slide? Okay, I just want to start out. Um, I know this isn't a psychology lecture, but in my sport and exercise psychology module, I like to ask people this question. And uh, I like to ask, what's the most effective form of exercise? And I get answers like, um, oh, it's uh, high intensity interval training. Uh, last year, somebody said, uh, it's, it's a deadlift. And then some astute people say, well, it's, um, it depends on your goals because I've always phrased this question without reference to any particular goal. But I think really the best form of exercise is the one that you're most likely to do regularly and consistently because exercise is a behavior that requires you to be uh, doing it regularly in order to gain, gain the benefits. And in fact, exercise is a behavior really opens up the door for psychology because exercise is so affected by those other kinds of behavioral processes which matter when it comes to actually doing it or not doing it. Um, and if I just go on to the next slide. Um, 
we'll be coming on to some of the psychology of exercise a little bit later everybody and um, just to start out with some context now of course right now we all know this kind of age we're living in and i guess the implications for physical activity but even before covid there were developments weren't there around exercise to deal with technology so even though there's always been i suppose um uh, the ability to buy home fitness equipment only recently have you had home fitness equipment which will uh, stream a live class into your living room or enable you to compare your performance on a peloton bike with that of somebody else so there have been challenges to exercise in a public facility for um, a long time uh, and particularly with technology and now with covid maybe some people are asking well why would you even want to exercise in a public place when you could do it in the house with no risk of catching covid and other people not looking at you etc and i think right now in england facilities are all closed aren't they um they're not closed in much of scotland so they're not closed in aberdeen um but you no know, things just open and close depending on the severity of, of covid um and of course some people are concerned aren't they that they might go to a gym and they might catch covid at the facility at the swimming pool in the changing room at whatever even though it's claimed to be low you know groups like uk active believe the risk is really low of catching it at a facility some people will continue to be put off and i guess the other thing that counts against exercise in public is and this is what it was like for me personally for a long time a lot of people just feel like well i'm going to go in there and it's going to be full of super buff people and i'll be the single skinny nerd and they'll all look at me and laugh at me of course it's probably not the case but the fact that gyms are just seen as intimidating by some people can be a reason why some people might think well it's better just to work out at home or even not at all but against all of these challenges maybe there are actually some benefits of exercising in a public place where people are around and that is something that we are exploring in this particular piece of work and started out it started out as a project to try and understand the experiences of exercising in public uh, public in, in general, not just in a facility like a gym, but it could be on the street, in a park, or it could be a facility like a swimming pool. What are the positive elements of exercise in public and what are the negative elements of it? And the project started out like that. And we started this particular project in 2015. And I'll tell you more about it in a moment. Just before that, let's just start on a little bit of some of relevant psychology around uh, exercising in a, in a group. So, um, you know, for a long time, it's been known that doing things around other people can have an impact on how well you perform, whether you do it or not. You know, there was a classic study done by, uh, it was Norman Triplett, 1898, and uh, he showed that cyclists in a group raced faster than they were alone. So that was, I guess, one of us almost sort of first sort of sports psychology type studies. But he did a follow on experiment where he gave children a physical task, which was a bit like rolling, uh, reeling in a, a fishing line, but on an experimental apparatus he built. And he found that when he got them to do the task with other children watching compared to alone, when others were watching or when they did it with other children, they did it faster. So that kind of effect where alongside other people you do a better performance or you try harder that's known as social facilitation um, you know there's no total understanding of how and when that works there's no single theory that explains it um, but some studies have looked at just having mere presence alone so there was one study in the 1980s where they had uh, observers seated on a forest trail and people running past them they found that when there was a seated observer runners tended to go quicker than when there was nobody watching them so maybe just mere presence can can have an effect um, so that's social facilitation um, not particularly well understood but it's something which has been studied uh, a lot now, when I used to do classes for sports science students, I would ask them, how could you get people to exercise more? Often they would say, well, just have some competition between between the exercises. There's some evidence that for some people, those who just happen to be of a more competitive kind of personality, that competition um, can be can be helpful, um, but not for everybody. Um, something else that's been studied is just getting support from others, which could be helpful information or it could be um, verbal encouragement, you know, you're doing great. 
<clears throat> or it could be it could be practical support like a spotter helping you lift particularly heavy weight and we tend to call that in psychology social support and there's a huge literature around social support generally finding that when you've got social support you know you tend to persist despite challenges uh, you tend to do things better so social support can be quite powerful and there have been studies where um, social support have been has been created um, for example, there was one study where just having somebody in the next room who could provide social support, um, uh, even if they didn't draw on that person's social support, um, uh, enabled uh, greater performance at a laboratory-based <coughs> so laboratory exercise task. Something else that happens in social settings is we get uh, ideas from other people about how much we ourselves are able to do. So there was a study that came out last year that I thought was really interesting and it was about spotters who are the people who might help you in the weightlifting exercise and it was about um, an experimental bench press and they had spotters who were visible versus not visible and they found that the weight uh, lifters were able to lift more weight when the spotter was visible even though the spotter did not actually provide any assistance. And that was interpreted as the um, message being given that because the spotter is there and because the spotter is not helping you, they believe you can lift this weight and you're drawing on their confidence in you. That's one of the sources of what we tend to call self-efficacy, which is a confidence you can perform a particular behavior. It's quite strongly related to whether you actually try and how well you do once you do uh, make the, the attempt. Um, Something else about being around other people is you might just enjoy it more. So there's research from uh, 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 studies about the experience of exercise in older adults. That one of the things that they tend to um, appreciate is having other people, particularly of a similar age group, and that provides enjoyable social interactions, um, which can just be, you know, just about everyday life, just something else which is pleasurable that you get from the exercise. And then something else that's been studied more recently, particularly by uh, Deborah Feltz in, in Michigan, is known as the Curler effect. And that's a group process where you've got a, a group members of various abilities. The weakest member of the group increases their effort or their performance when it turns out their performance is key to the group's success. And uh, Feltz has done various experiments normally using virtual workout partners showing that when she can create these conditions people do try harder and will put more into ab exercises or cycling tasks or, or whatever it is so this is just material that was already out there in the literature um, and which might suggest some benefits you might get from exercising around other people but that's very top down isn't it I mean, it would be easy to do a literature review on this kind of thing and get some insights, but that could be really divorced from the kind of real life experiences that people have. And so that's one of the reasons we wanted to study this experience of exercise in public qualitatively from the bottom up, seeing what people's real experiences were. And that was the basis of this project. So the wider study was, like I said, a kind of exploration about exercise in public in general, you know, positive effects, negative effects, whether it was in a facility or whether it was perhaps at a park or a forest trail, etc. cetera. Um, within that wider study, the piece I'm gonna share with you today is about potential benefits of exercising in public places. And the kind of things we're interested in are, what are those benefits? How might they link to aspects of psychology and how are those benefits you might get from exercising in public how are they perceived to be helpful so those kinds of questions are well suited to a qualitative study um, and qualitative studies are when you're not dealing really with numbers instead you're dealing with uh, verbal descriptions of experience that you get from people's lived experience, I suppose, um, but you elicit from an interview or a focus group. And what you're looking for is um, the verbal descriptions and the meaning they make about things. And that's something that's difficult to get from reducing things to numbers and statistics. Um, most of my research is around quantitative methods, um, but um, with this uh, project, by leading this project, I was branching out into, into qualitative. Um, and one of the, I guess, the key aim of this particular study is to identify the themes in the exercise's experience. 
are the benefits of working out in public places. And by identifying themes for a process we call thematic analysis, more about that in a second, um, we're able to look for the, I suppose, the general or the most common strands of experience across all of the participants' experiences of so a whole um, set of interviews that, that we conducted. And we had 27 interviews. So those were our aims. Um, and this really was an exploratory study. Um, so very much an exploration of both experiences. So the, the, the study's methods really involved many of the similar kind of methods you get in qualitative studies, particularly in psychology and, and health psychology. And we got the qualitative data really from one-to-one -one interviews. So we interviewed 27 uh, exercisers. They all currently exercised. And they were quite an active sample. So um, on the go down leisure time exercise questionnaire, which we gave them really just to understand how much exercise the sample was doing, nearly all of them were active enough for a health benefit, uh, according to cutoffs publicized by Godin. Um, and they tended to rate themselves as relatively high in fitness on the international fitness scale, which is a kind of self-report measure of fitness. Um, so the interviews were all face to face. As you can see from this, they were done in summer 2015 when nobody imagined COVID would happen. Nobody imagined that you'd never be able to do face to face interviews for a year or two. So they were face to face. Um, I did all the interviews myself. Uh, we recruited the participants from posters mainly uh, through some contacts. We had posters up at, at council run leisure centres around Aberdeen. We also had posters up in the campus sports centre at RGU, which is also a public facility. So it's not limited to students and staff. It's open to the public. It really acts as the leisure centre for that particular part of the city. And we also had some members of the university community from the university's weekly email bulletin. Uh, the sample we got were, and I haven't included here how many of them were students, but I think it was about a third. Those certainly weren't all students, probably because uh, you know we were doing it in the summer and we tried to get people who were something other than students, although quite a few were university staff. Um, the sample was about 60% were female. The ages were quite a nice spread from 22 was the youngest and, and they were students um, to 55, but the median age was about 34 um, and they were all, they were all uh, white. Um, so the average interview length was about 45 minutes. Um, shortest I did was 20 minutes. I think sometimes qualitative interviews, you know, sometimes you just you know, don't gel. Um, so 20 minutes was the shortest. The longest I did was about an hour and a half. But on average, they were mostly around the kind of 45 minutes kind of area. And then we got the interviews transcribed. Not in 2015. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, the study didn't uh, get analysed for a while was because, like I said at the start, we began with no funding. And uh, we began with me naively saying, oh, well, I'll transcribe them in the summer. Um, but I had other projects on. I was doing other things. We were developing a new master's course. And in the end, it didn't happen. Luckily, the RGU Foundation stepped in and we were able to get money to get them transcribed. But that was a couple of years later. So they were transcribed by an agency. Um, and the kinds of things that we asked, um, the kind of things that we asked in the interview, well, they were things like, uh, tell me about the kind of exercise that you do, um, talking through each of the different types of, of exercise and the kind of settings. Well, the most common setting, as you might expect, were gyms. But there were some people who exercised at swimming pools, but also some who were uh, exercise in parks, um, as well as trails, streets, and one or two other other kinds of other kinds of places um, as as well. And uh, the kinds of uh, questions that I asked about um, were what kind of places do you exercise in? Talking through some of the positives and the negatives about each one, asking for examples um, about how they'd interact with others or how others had had an impact somehow on them, and also any changes they would make to the um, the exercise setting. Um, uh, okay. Anything else I want to tell you about these interviews? Can't think of anything like that, but of course you can ask me later on if you want to ask a little bit more about what happened in uh, in those interviews where we collected this uh, this data. Okay. 
So the way we analyzed these data um, was out of a transcription, we subjected them to a procedure called thematic analysis, which is really commonly used in applied psychology research, um, maybe even as sports science research as well. Um, and the Braun and Clark paper from 2006, where they give a quite detailed protocol for how you run this thematic analysis. I think it must be one of the most downloaded psychology papers um, in, in recent years. Um, so, uh, thematic analysis is uh, one which is, well, it's probably the one most people learn first, the qualitative um, uh, anal anal analysis method most people learn first. Um, it's quite flexible, it can be applied to a wide range of different types of data, so it doesn't rely on you having a particular, um, I suppose, philosophical stance, it doesn't have a particular requirement for data be of a certain type. Um, so you can use it with a wide range of different types of, of data um, and you can use it as well. You can use it top down to code for pre-existing categories, but you can also use it bottom up to go through the transcripts line by line and just see what comes out from the participants experiences. So we probably describe it as being inductive. So we did an inductive thematic analysis. Um, and kinds of steps you have in a thematic analysis. Well, first of all, you familiarize yourself with the data, so reading over the transcripts over and over again, listening to the interviews. Secondly, going through line by line and just uh, putting codes by each little section, maybe a sentence, maybe a couple of sentences that seems to say something about what it is we were interested in, which you then uh, created as, as these codes, which we did using a piece of software called Envivo. And once that had been done for all of the um, all of the uh, transcripts, I did that personally, and then the second author, who was Brian McCann, did that independently for a sample of 20%, which was about five of the uh, of uh, 27 transcripts, just to check we were coding things that were similar. And based on that, we were able to agree on and discuss what the codes would be. Um, kind of make it as similar as possible between the transcripts, which I then went on to, to do the rest of. And then the three uh, researchers in our team met together and then we collated the codes into ones that just seemed to go together. So that, that's the collating code step. And they, they get collated into what tend to be called themes. So things which have a, a code in and seem to have a similarity might go together into the same theme or perhaps into a sub theme, which is part of a larger theme. And then we reviewed the themes and how well they're working. Um, we moved some codes around, we moved some sub themes around, we played out with different, played around different names of the themes, and then finally we enabled, we arrived at these kind of final themes and started to write up uh, the, the report. And we've got the report fairly, fairly close to being ready, should be able to go to a journal, um, I don't know, in a, a couple of weeks, something like that. And the kind of on, ontological or phenomenal, uh, kind of stance that we tend to take and the three of us in our team is critical realism. Uh, so we tend to believe there is some kind of reality out there that we can access, but that it is filtered through the participants, you know, experiences and um, language and biases. So we don't have an easy, uh, clear path to accessing truth, but we have insights into it from um, the kind of procedures that we go through. Um, so critical realism. And in terms of qualitative methods, this is a fairly basic study as, uh, as the use of qualitative methods in psychology goes. So this is certainly not breaking any, breaking the mold in any way in terms of qualitative methods for psychology study. This would be seen as a very, very basic kind of, kind of a method. Um, and we derived from this analysis, everybody, we derived three themes, um, some of which had some sub themes. And these three themes, everyone, kind of answering the, the question and I'm going to go into each of these themes and sub themes. I've got a slide in each one. I'll tell you a bit more about our findings within it and I've got some quotes that illustrate, illustrate these. So the themes that we identified um, were first of all that by exercising in public you're often able to do more than you could alone. Part of that is through learning from other people I'll talk more about that in a moment. Part of it is through just supporting each other. Uh, secondly, the uh, exercise together with others was enjoyed more. 
And thirdly, that by exercising around others, even if you didn't interact with them, that had impacts on motivation and self-regulation of behavior, keeping you at it for a little bit more, pushing you a little bit harder than you might otherwise work, giving you a comparison standard uh, which you work towards, and in some cases, even being a source of inspiration and, and greater confidence. And I have got slides on each of these, and maybe I won't go through um, all of these quotes in depth, um, but if you'd like a copy of these slides, I could email them to you uh, later if you, if you ask me. So what, in the first theme, which we call doing more than you can alone, part of the findings were about learning socially from others. Sometimes that was verbal learning, like telling someone else about a class they might find useful, and it was just observational learning. Now, sometimes that was about what exercises to perform, so participant four at the top here is talking about using the assisted dip machine. So she sees somebody else using it, thinks, oh, I could try that. And then she begins using it consistently herself in her subsequent workouts. But also it could also be around technique. So some people used others, watched them to try to refine their own technique. And it happened both in classes, exercise classes, as well as a kind of solo exercise. Participant 17, but you can see here, she is copying or seeing the backstroke of others, using that to correct her own backstroke, making improvements. And sometimes it was just as pragmatic as copying the equipment others were using or the outfits they were wearing. So participant 27 here, I know this uh, quote is a bit cut off. She is starting swimming. She sees others wearing goggles and thinks, well, I should get some goggles as well. So learning from others and being able to exercise better, I suppose, as a result through that kind of observational learning. But a second part was, I suppose, what you might call social support. Um, so uh, participant 19 is a, a group runner and talks about how in those running groups, you do not leave others behind. You know, we look, we kind of look after each other. Um, and I suppose you might think of that as instrumental social support, practical help. You will stop if somebody else stops and you will stop to help them. Um, but also the social support could be encouragement. So participant 22 here was somebody who had a very strong community feeling in her gym and uh, they would all meet at this kind of similar time. They would go at a similar time each morning and they would encourage each other and they would talk to each other and participant 22 says well she noticed women who has lost a massive amount of, of weight people would go up and say well you look amazing so this is something she noticed consistently there was emotional social support going on in in some of those cases and something else about support was for some people just having somebody else there an exercise buddy um, even if they didn't particularly do anything at uh, out of the ordinary to help just having somebody else there was a source of comfort. So participant nine here um, uh, is a, a woman who works out in the free weights gym of the uh, campus sports center, says, I find it easier because he's there. He is a training partner who she trains with, I guess, partly because at some level still feel that I don't quite belong in there. So having somebody else there is a source of comfort in a setting that may otherwise be one where she feels a bit of a, a fish out of water. So just being able to do more than you could alone through learning, or I guess some kinds of social support, was one of the themes that we identified that some people are benefiting from when they exercise in, in public places. Um, let's move on now onto the next theme, everybody, and that was the fact that exercise was enjoyed more by at least some of the participants when they were around other people. So participant 12 here uh, was somebody who exercised in various, various fitness classes and was talking about how exercising uh, in the classes compared to when he used to exercise alone in a gym was much more enjoyable. Something about the buzz, as he put it, of all 50 people exercising together was just something extra compared to when he was doing the kind of cardio and strength type exercises um, uh, alone. Um, but it wasn't just in, in classes. Um, it happened sometimes uh, in, in other settings as well. I'm going to come back to participant 15 in the middle there in a second. But participant 20 was somebody who worked out alone in, in a gym setting. Uh, he didn't speak to anyone. He was just working out alone. And I was kind of asking him about this. And he says, well, on a rare occasion, I have been in the gym and there's been not another soul around. It's kind of lifeless. 
but the downside of that is it kind of lacks atmosphere it's a bit kind of empty so having other people around even with not interacting with them was sometimes uh, appreciated as you know just something kind of extra something else about uh, exercising together was uh, talked about by participant 15 who was uh, doing uh, park-based exercise classes and these were classes that were highly sociable the people who were very uh, very similar kind of person who would uh, go into these classes they were very carefully tailored and they would be talking to each other during the class and there would be an instructor as well and um, sometimes the instructor would use competition sometimes they would just talk with each other and what she participant 15 highlights is you know, it's a competitive situation or when you're paired with someone else, so just talking about, you know, your children or something, you kind of forget you're exercising. So being around other people, in this case, when there was competition or um, even just communication, enabled just feeling a little bit easier, not focusing on the you know, difficulties of, of exercising. And there's some other research that suggests that some of the benefits when people compete in exercise settings come from not paying as much attention to the kind of internal cues to exercise, like the fatigue, the, the effort. So greater enjoyment uh, of exercising in public was one. I'm sure there are other people who wouldn't enjoy exercise in public, but this is what came from some of the participants in, uh, in this study. And then thirdly, and I think this was a theme where there was the most, I suppose, going on with four sub-themes, was the one we called Sparing You On, um, where um, being around others causes you to do a bit more, be a bit more motivated, put the motivation into action more often, etc. One of the impacts of just being around others was keeping up motivation to attend. And for some of the participants, this was as simple as just seeing others out in the city. So for participant 10, it was um, just seeing other people out on the streets in the countryside. You see other runners out. It's quite uplifting. I see other people running. It makes me want to go running. And um, there's some evidence that, you know, the human mind, it, it's a lot like a card file. And the things that are at the front of your card file, you know, are kind of more foremost in your mind uh, of a kind of, that if their goals are the ones which are most likely to be activated um, and when you have your own goals and you see somebody else doing that same behavior that leads to the goal um, it's likely according to some research that will trigger your own goal and make it more of a priority for you so it will bring it to the front of that mental card file so seeing other people exercise just keeping up that motivation keeping that goal priority high and then something else is, I suppose, which is becoming more popular now, isn't it, as a kind of concept. Um, um, and I think a lot of personal trainers draw on this concept, which is, I suppose, you might call it accountability. Um, you know, just arranging to have somebody else <coughs> there or arranging that you, somebody else is going to ask you, did you go today? Um, and being accountable and held accountable if they don't go. And what we're seeing with participant one here um, who is actually a little bit, I think actually she was 22. Um, but anyway, that's just, she's saying, if you get caught up in something, it's easy to go, well, I'll go later. But if I know that she's going to be there, and that's her workout partner who she exercises with, waiting for me, definitely that incentive to leave what you're doing and go over. And so in psychology terms, you might think about that as helping you put motivation into action. It's helping you to self-regulate your behavior. But there were some people for whom seeing others exercising had no impact on their own motivation. Participant 16, who was a swimmer, uh, said, how often I go just depends on my own scheduling. So for some people, seeing others exercise or having others around kept up their motivation or their ability to put motivation into action. Well, let's look at the next sub theme, which was social facilitation. And that's kind of quite a general term, really. Um, but Social facilitation was really about people doing more when other people were around. Um, so, for example, in class situations, participant 12 here was talking about how in a class you do more and you keep going to the end of a, a track, I suppose, in a Les Mills uh, fitness class because you don't want to be one who gives up because you're easily, easily kind of spotted. So that was a fairly prosaic way of um, keeping up your efforts because other people would be watching you and would ask are you okay if you if you stop but something else about uh, this sub thing was that you know just seeing other people who were still continuing when you were thinking about stopping 
for some people made people carry on anyway. And that also was found in classes. Um, but even uh, the participant 25 here, I think was uh, talking about running with others. Seeing others still going made him think, well, if these can do it, uh, then if they can do it, well, I can do it um, as well. Now also in this sub theme, there was some evidence of competition. So participant 16, who I just mentioned was a swimmer, would see other people and would, he described himself as somebody who had a competitive personality and he would uh, see other people swimming in these kind of lanes and would try and match their speed. So he says, I try to go faster than them. I try to compete with them, even though I don't really want to. And by competing with them, he's swimming faster than he, he otherwise would. And just something else about that social facilitation sub theme was when there was a workout partner or somebody around, somebody that sometimes they could explicitly try and just push the exercises to go a little bit harder. So participant nine um, trains with a workout partner in, in weight training, partner pushes her to go a little bit harder, even when she's thinking about you know giving up or when she thinks I can't do that before she has even tried. If you just look at the penultimate sub theme, there's also some evidence people would use others as a comparison standard. Um, so participant 25 in a boxing club would judge his own abilities based on those uh, around, uh, around him. And uh, some people would then look at the, what other people were doing and would use that as a way to judge whether what level they should work at. So participant 17 is, I think, talking here about a yoga class. She sees other people older than her doing the middle versions, which I don't think it's a yoga class, I think it's an aerobics class, who could do a middle version of a you know, levels of difficulty of an exercise. So she thinks, well, if older people can me can uh, old people older than me can do a middle version, then I'm going to do that too. And she's using that as a comparison standard to work out or to judge how hard she should be working. And then finally, for some people, it was just a kind of, you know, an, I'm better than you. Participant seven here talks about that. He's training with his friends. He's lifting more. He thinks I'm better than you as a result. He goes on to say, I know I'm not, but that's how a little bit how he feels. And now the final sub theme, everybody, was about inspiration. I, I, I think inspiration is a concept often kind of bandied around, but it's really not psychologized. It's really not studied very much psychologically, except in a couple of really old papers. And I, I really want to do a project on the psychology of inspiration in the, in the future. Now, for some people, uh, they would look at somebody else, usually another exerciser, and think, oh, I could be like them. Now, with participant 14 here, it's, um, they're seeing uh, participant 14 is saying, well, when I see the teacher do a certain exercise, I think, well, of course, he's able to do it. He's an expert. But when I see somebody similar to me doing it, then I think I can do it as well. My confidence increases. Um, and that's similar to what I suppose in psychology we would call self-efficacy. And you can build self-efficacy, which is your confidence to do something by modeling, seeing other people similar to you doing it you think I can do it as well. That seemed to be what's going on here with participant 14. But seeing other people succeed easily could also undermine that confidence. With participant nine here, she's talking about a pole dancing class and she says, there's a particular move I'm nowhere, nowhere near getting yet, but most other people in the class have got it and they get disheartened. What is it they're doing that I'm not? What am I missing? Reinforces the fact I can't do it. So seeing others succeed easily while you struggle can undermine confidence. Um, I just want, I know that's not a benefit of exercise, but that's just something I wanted to draw in there as a kind of parallel to um, confidence effects. So much of this slide, everyone, is about confidence, I guess, and what we call self-efficacy. The next slide, just to finish off, this one is a, an example, I suppose, of inspiration. So this is participant 27, um, who was a, a weightlifter, talks about how he has been inspired by someone he meets in the gym, someone he perceives as, you know, he looks up to him, you know, he was massive. I trained with him sometimes. I looked up to him, wanted to be as strong as him, really wanted to know what he was doing. So he acts as a kind of a, a role model. Now there's some research, and I think this is by Ziva Kunda in the 1990s, that when you see a, a kind of model like this, the inspirational effect depends on how attainable you think it is. So the participant seven, who was already doing quite a lot of weight training, probably saw this 
massive other exerciser as an achievable goal. Whereas for me, maybe I might look at that person and think, no way, I could never be that way. So, and it wouldn't have an inspiring effect. So the attainability could well be important, at least according to that 1990s research. So attainability being important in there being an inspiration effect, perhaps. I think there's a lot more research to do around inspiration. Well, everyone, I mean, I think this was an interesting kind of exploratory kind of study. It's got some limitations, though. I mean, one of the limitations is, you know, it's a qualitative study with just 27 exercises. And the people who put themselves forward, or maybe they're unrepresentative of most people, that they certainly were current exercises, maybe people who don't exercise anymore, or who used to exercise and have dropped out, maybe really don't benefit at all from exercise in public. We did also have people talk about the, uh, the negative aspects of exercise uh, in, in public, that they were still current exercises, um, recruited from mostly posters in leisure centers and the campus sports center, and a couple from the, the email bulletin uh, at the university. So there's limitation, I guess, in the sampling. And also we were really relying on participants' verbal descriptions of their experiences, you know, descriptions that could be altered by, you know, the demand characteristics of a situation um, that could be altered by memory. Maybe certain incidents just didn't come to mind in the interview or were embellished because they knew it was an interview about the experience of exercise in public. And maybe getting some actual uh, observational data as a researcher can be helpful, possibly using an ethnography where you go into a situation and you observe. And I really want to do an ethnography of CrossFit at some at some point. Um, this piece of work has only looked at benefits, but we also have data on the downsides of exercise in public. That will be a forthcoming publication. Um, and one of those following studies that we've been working on, that we were going to start but haven't yet, is about uh, what you might call intimidation in gym settings. I can tell you I've got years of experience of feeling intimidated in gym settings. Not so much now, but in the past I did. What are the psychological predictors of that and how might we be able to reduce it? Because that's a psychological effect, isn't it? Just to finish off everyone, just some implications about future exercise. We've got to be cautious with these kinds of implications. Um, when it's just an exploratory study. Some of the kinds of things that could be thought about with more research could be, well, maybe we could structure exercise to take advantage of some of these effects like social learning, social support in the exercise setting, uh, inspiration from others, building confidence from seeing others similar to you succeed. But it strikes me that maybe this kind of thing happens already in CrossFit. I personally haven't uh, exercised in CrossFit, but I've spoken to quite a few people who have. And it seems there's a strong social element in CrossFit, including of support. Also, there's competitive elements sometimes. Maybe that type of exercise is already is already there. Maybe it can be, maybe some of these ideas can be applied to other kinds of exercise too. And I'm sure we'll find there certainly are skillful group exercise leaders, skillful personal trainers who are already taking advantage of some of these effects but maybe we could make it into a kind of taxonomy of different effects and make it easier to draw on them with different ones for maybe different people maybe matching them to different personality types even um, maybe we could even harness some of these effects in online exercise such as uh, exercise at home so just to conclude everybody exercises in public places at least sometimes we observe others they compare themselves to others, and sometimes they communicate with other exercisers. And how much they do that probably varies depending on the setting. You know, some, some gyms are very social, aren't they? Some not social at all. So perhaps varying between the culture of a particular facility or setting, and maybe individual personality traits. Some people are more extroverted, aren't they, than others, more sociable than others. But even if the exercise never speaks to anyone or only glimpses other people, just perceiving that others are there may have an impact on the exerciser, sometimes to their benefit, at least for some exercises. And in psychological terms, some of those processes could be social learning, you know, Bandura style, social support, various social facilitation processes, social comparison, perhaps, and social regulation of motivation and behavior. Um, I just want to finish off everybody before we have some questions and discussion. Um, learning is always about, isn't it, making mistakes, trying harder the next time, learning from the kind of mistakes you've made. 
just a couple of things I want to highlight as a, as a developing researcher, things I learned from leading this, uh, this study. Um, well, first of all, you can have your own experiences as a source of ideas. So when I created the study and I came up with initial idea and then I kind of brought on board uh, Brian and, and Gemma, it was often kind of based on my own experiences of exercising in swimming pools and, and gym settings. Uh, usually freaking out about it, but your own experiences sometimes can be a source of ideas. I guess one of the key learnings is we made the mistake of starting with no funding and thinking we'll just transcribe these interviews ourselves. What happened? We had no time to do it with all these classes and other things we're working on. I think you've got to start a study based on the resources you've got. You've got to be realistic. So uh, if I was to start another study, I would look for funding first. And um, to get that funding from the IG Foundation, uh, basically, um, I asked our research coordinator in the department. He said, send a desperate email to the vice chancellor, see if you can get any, any money. And the vice chancellor did arrange some funding from the IG Foundation. That was what really was a lifeline for us. And so asking for help when you need it matters in research. You've got to build a team of the right expertise. We started out just with me and, and Brian but we felt like we didn't have enough qualitative expertise between us. So we got Gemma Stevens on board. He's an experienced qualitative researcher. Building the team matters. And just don't try to put too much into one paper. We've already had a paper based on this rejected from a prominent psychology journal. There was just too much going on in the paper. Um, so now we're refining it into two separate papers, one about benefits, and there'll be one about costs as well of exercise. And I'm sure you've heard me talk for too long, everybody. I'm afraid this is what my students get all the time. Um, so I'd be happy now to hear what kind of questions you have, um, hear your insights about it, um, particularly as people who are you know, experienced in uh, exercise uh, settings. And, and just encourage you to email me as well if you want to. So thank you, everyone, for your attention. I will now stop talking. Francis, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, it was really great to, to hear about that research and, you know, that social support coming through. Um, we, we found the same in our bereavement work, so it's really nice to see it in a, in a general population too. So um, I've put a question in the chat, but we'll go to Ash um, first. And uh, Jeff, I wonder if you can um, enable Ash's mic so he can ask the question. I'm just doing it now. One second. Okay. Ash, if you want to, if not, I'll ask. Go for it. Should be able to talk now, Ash. Let's really find out Ash has gone. Uh, oh, he's noisy. OK, fair enough, Ash, I'll ask for you. Um, right, Francis, so Ash has asked, could it be argued that people who can exercise regularly in isolation are more robust to adversities? So e.g. a class being cancelled may stop people from exercising altogether. Um, how can we help such people to overcome these problems? Hmm. Run that by me one more time, Angel. I want to make sure I understand Ash's question. So um, could people who exercise regularly in isolation, so people who exercise on their own, are they more robust to adversity? So when people are exercising together and a class gets cancelled, perhaps they might not exercise. Um, but how could we help people to overcome that? I think that's what Ash is asking. Oh, OK, I can see actually Ash is kind of comment in this chat box as well. Um, OK, well, I, I suppose if your class is cancelled <coughs> um, or your facility is closed, well, y yes, I suppose you would be more affected, wouldn't you, by, by this kinds of thing? Um, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest, Ash. I don't have any suggestions about it. I mean, I'd be really keen to hear what you think about it. Um, I mean, I do think there is an element, isn't there, of resilience in behaviour we need to try to promote. And I think one of the ways we tend to do that in health psychology is through what we call coping plans. You know, how are you going to get around a particular setback? How are you going to still exercise even if the gym closes? Um, that's all that comes to mind, to be honest. I mean, Angel, have you got any insights about it? I, I think that's um, I think that's kind of the way I would respond as well. I know I think Alison's on the call, who's one of our Get Active um, uh, registered exercise professionals for Active Hearts, and we have um, in our booklet something called um, Overcoming Hurdles. So it's very much kind of what you were saying: those coping plans, the if-then plans. The if -then plans. So if my thing's so cancelled, then, then I'll do whatever. 
Yeah, that's what, kind of what comes to mind, really. Um, I'm afraid I can't be any more helpful than that, Ash. I'm so sorry. Um, but I think it is a real issue, isn't it? That kind of resilience and being robust to things happening. Um, yeah. Thanks, Francis. Francis, another question. How can we, um, this social support side of things and social facilitation, for, for individuals who aren't engaging in physical activity, how can we harness that to get people to engage more, like from the onset, maybe if they're not engaging at all? Yeah. Mm. Uh, one thing that comes to mind for me is the importance of uh, school exercise. Um, I think we all start out, don't we, in school PE class. Uh, and I think it's in school PE class where uh, expectations are kind of kind of set about what it's like to exercise uh, kind of around others. I know there's kind of research suggesting that school PE is really so different from adult kind of exercise that maybe they don't, one doesn't kind of generalize really to the other. Um, but I suppose what comes to mind is just in that setting where people are all exercising together because they have to at school, maybe setting some of these beneficial social processes in motion at that time, you know, getting them to, well, I guess partly doing more realistic kind of things an adult would do rather than, you know, kind of sports um, necessarily all the time, but getting people to give social support, encouraging people to learn from others. Um, something else that has crossed my mind sometimes, I don't know what other people think about this, is just preparing people better for exercise in, say, gym settings. I mean, maybe just general educational interventions like YouTube videos about, you know, or leaflets. Like, you will see other people doing this, it will give you ideas. Um, maybe that's something that has crossed my mind that we could better prepare people psychologically, really, for exercise in a group setting rather than just in you go, here you are in the class. Um, that has crossed my mind sometimes. But I'd be really keen to hear what other people think about that. Um, that may have been just a rant. What do others think or any other questions people want to ask? Feel free to put them in the chat or say something. I mean, Francis, I just, just while people are thinking of perhaps adding questions in there, um, we heard that there was a um, one of our exercise professionals had found someone who'd signed up for a netball class and um, sitting in their car outside you know the the gym setting and um, quite nervous and not wanting to go in on their own and it was it was only because the professional had gone and said are you here for that class and the person said oh yeah and she said oh do you want to come in with me and she actually said to her weeks later if you hadn't have picked me up there i probably wouldn't have gone in so there's definitely mm -hmm. something about preparing people and the social side of things i i have heard uh, similar stories actually of other kinds of exercise where people just feel like i don't go in i don't don't want to go in. even to crossfit class i've heard that um but when they go in they felt actually it was okay i think there's real social effects there that really matter yeah, well, I mean, your research has showed it, hasn't it? You know, once you get in, you've got all that social support there. That's true. But I think maybe some people also maybe not benefiting from the social support. Um, um, you know, maybe some people who, you know, don't talk to others, don't look at others. So I think some people certainly can. I think the interesting question is, who is it that does benefit from being uh, exercising in public? And who is it who doesn't? I think that'd be a really interesting kind of question to ask. Andrew, did you have your hands up there? Yeah, I did. Sorry, um, I, I stepped away for about two slides, so I apologise if you if you did raise this, Francis. But um, have you looked into people actually consciously choosing to exercise on their own, um, away from everyone else, just because they enjoy it, and not because it's a fear of pressures in gyms or fear of pressures um, in people's perceptions, just because it's a kind of um, it's a way to get away from the stresses and not to worry about how you necessarily look or what you're wearing or what people's perceptions are. Uh -huh. That's a great question, Andrew. And in fact, some of the participants did say that. They did say, I like to exercise on my own because that's how I clear my head, etc." I have a copy of our draft paper here, seeing if I can scroll through to find that quote, but I, I probably won't be able to um, in, within the five minutes I've got left. But yes, that, that was evident as well. Some people were saying things like, I just want to be on my own. I want to get my own kind of headspace. Um, I think that is a real issue. And I think for some people, it may just be personality. You know, some people vary based on those kind of differences um, and prefer to exercise solo. Um, that's why they exercise solo. So, yes, I think that is 
is really there. There are all these kinds of variations here um, that vary by not just the setting and what's happening socially, but by individual differences as well, like I think probably personality. And as you can tell, I've mentioned it a few times, I think probably extroversion, introversion is possibly one of those things. Um, being quite introverted myself, I kind of sympathize with uh, uh, introverts. Um, but you. I think that's a really good point, Andrew. Thanks. Thanks, Francis. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Chris Long's just put a comment in there as well, saying health-related fitness, in which pupils are taught about the use of um, generic gym kit and programs, uh, program their own fitness sessions for different goals, is on the PE curriculum in Northampton schools for years seven to eleven. Um, nationwide implication of this would be beneficial, but it's dependent on the school facilities. Mm, so, but, uh, that's a really good point. Uh, I don't, not sure I should say this, but one of the things I tell my sport and exercise psychology students, and you'll probably all completely lose respect for me now, but when I was in PE class at secondary school, I was actually put into remedial PE. Um, I was the worst at PE. Anyway, this remedial PE class focused on what Chris is calling health-related fitness. That was so helpful for me being in that class. So I was, we weren't doing any more of the football, we weren't doing any more of the basketball or the cricket. We were doing things like we did some badminton, we did various gym workouts, we did aerobics classes. It was very much like the kind of work you do as an adult. I just found that so helpful. So that's good to know. We've got some of our unscientific comment, but that, that's what Chris's comment reminded me of. So I, I think certainly there's something in there. I think school, school PE really matters. We've got some other comments. Uh, who, should, who should I address next, Angel? Um, well, up to you, but I'm mindful we've only got two more minutes. <laughs> uh, well, Kev's asked if you've got any negative comments of the study, just in a, in a, in a half a minute. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what you, what you mean by negative comments there, Kev. Um, yeah, sorry, Francis, uh, what I meant is, um, was there any sort of, most of the comments you got were positive, was there any <laughs> negative comments that came from um, from the um, clients or the participants. Yeah, about exercising in public. Yeah, well, yeah. Yes, there were, there were. And there are the kinds of things we really haven't included in this one, but um, that's something we're also looking at and there's probably going to be a separate a separate kind of study. Um, but yes, there were some negative comments and I feel, you know, I feel looked at about that kind of thing. Um, yes, I really cherry picked the positive ones for this particular piece of work, but we do have that kind of data um, as, as well. Actually, when I started the study kit, I was thinking that people would give loads of negative comments and everyone would be so negative about it. But actually, quite a few people were also gave many positive comments. That was, I guess, an unexpected finding. But you can get from qualitative research, you can't from quantitative. Yeah, I, I get that. Because um, sometimes a negative comment can help exercise practitioners to actually build a better, you know, system for people to to do um, exercise in public places. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter how hard they are to to uh, to um, um, take, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess it's kind of useful feedback, isn't it? Um, yeah. But yes, we have that data, and there's something we're working on. So it will it will see the light of day, Kev. Great stuff. And I can see Helen has related it back to um, the This Girl Can campaign as well and asking how your themes uh, link yeah. to this study. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm just looking at Helen's comment here. I know we're, I don't want to kind of take us too much over time, but yes, uh, Helen says, um, yeah, there's lots of good things in This Girl Can, isn't it? Like sort of, you know, fear of judgment, uh, et cetera. Um, have we considered the findings of this girl can and how it relates to the themes and findings of your study? No, is the answer to that, Helen. But I think certainly it's something we, we need to think about. Um, so I think that's a good point. Um, so, so the answer is no, we haven't, but we'll, I think we'll look into that. Um, Definitely I, I have seen some of those campaigns. I think they are really good uh, and sometimes relate to men as well. Um, uh, and yes. Stuff. Great stuff. Yeah, there's um, just a lot of similarities, Francis, between what you've presented here today and what I've read in This Girl Can and presented on This Girl Can. So mm -hmm. it's almost as if it's they're, they're quid pro quo. They're both equal in their findings. And I think you'd be good to, good to have a look at what they've found and how it can enhance oh, your life. When I think of This Girl Can, Helen, I tend to think of it as a kind of media campaign um, rather than a kind of research study. But there's some research as well out there, I take it, about it. Yeah, about female participation, the fear of judgment, getting over it, the acceptance of jiggling in lycra, etc. Yeah, I will look that up. Thank you very much. You see some synergies for the future coming out here, which is great. It's always a benefit of these um, these seminars. 
So Francis, um, I'm mindful of time. We could talk to you all day, but uh, we should we should end it there. But I just want to say a huge thank you on behalf of Vice Bar for um, for being our guest speaker today. It's it's been really interesting. Um, I'm hearing your study and having that discussion with you. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Jeff to just let people know about our next session. But Francis, um, thank you so much. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, um, Francis. It was really interesting. Um, so just to update you all on the next seminar, uh, it's going to be on the 16th of December. Um, we have uh, Dr. Olivia Brown from the University of Lincoln who's going to be talking. Uh, the session is going to be a biomechanics stroke engineering study, so it'll be quite interesting uh, to listen to. Uh, again, same time, three till four and online. So we look forward to seeing you all then. Thanks, Jeff. Right, thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of the day. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, Francis. Francis, no just stay on for a moment. Oh, okay, I'll stay on. The only rubbish bit at the end is you can't catch up afterwards. <laughs> oh, there's positives and negatives, isn't there, to doing things online? Yeah, that's true, that's true. That was really interesting though, thank you so much. I was going to ask you a question about Covid, but we ran out of time. Yeah, I was going to ask that. As well. I was going to ask one on Covid. You could ask me now. You know, well, how, how much do you ask. think it's had an impact on exercising in yeah. public places? Um, okay, well, in terms of the kind of processes we got in this particular study, I'm not sure it's had too much of an impact. Um, and the answer, I suppose, to questions like, do people fear now exercising in public because of COVID? I don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah, I, I think we'd, you'd have to study it. Um, you know, you'd have to get some kind of data about it. There was some um, stuff that come out of Sport England that um, Helen Ives had shared early in the lockdown, where they'd asked people um, what might stop them from exercising in public places like gyms. And they said, um, you know, the biggest fear was um, physical distancing, the ability to be physically distant. Mm -hmm. so I had an image on the slides that I, I got, got yesterday. I don't know if you saw it, but it was people exercising in a plastic bubble. I saw that. Where's that from? Well, I, I just it was just a search on the Internet. And I think it's from California um, and was a news story. Um, so I, I suppose that, but that might make exercise even less appealing, mightn't it, if we're going to be in a bubble? almost yeah. like having a spotlight on you isn't it you in this bubble yeah um so i don't know i don't know what the levels as well well so that's that's what would stop me exercising in a bubble i wouldn't exercise i'd get a bit closer I would, would not exercise instead um so yeah but um i know covid has really kind of thrown, thrown all the balls up in the air hasn't it when it comes to exercise and sorry francis it would sorry, be go on, go on kev